Cool, I'm gonna share my screen so you should be able to see what I'm seeing, hopefully. Basically, this talk is aiming to be a sort of an absolute basic crash course in audio for for video. And so particularly for DSLR and compact system cameras, especially. Um, a little bit first on my background, just so you know who I am. Uh, my name is Alex Theakston, and I'm a YouTuber. I actually make YouTube videos about synthesizers and music equipment. Um, I also make a podcast, um, and I'm a, my day job, I'm the brand manager for Rode Microphones in the UK. So Rode, as many of you will know, are a very, very popular Australian mic brand. They've been around for many, many, many years, decades. Obviously, they make the eponymous video mic, which probably some of you may own or certainly will have seen people using, which is kind of what you see in the picture there. And we'll focus on kind of video mics and that sort of end of the technology spectrum. But although I work for Rode, you know, all of the things I'm talking about are very general. There's nothing that I'm going to talk about that doesn't really apply to any other you know, mic, no matter which brand it's from. And also the techniques apply even if you have kind of quote unquote higher end things like, you know, pro shotguns and kind of um, you know, more expensive um, lavalier systems and things like that. Like all these techniques are very basic and they haven't really changed for sort of, you know, a hundred years kind of since people started putting microphones in front of people. Um, so I think the main thing is just to say, and I can, I can speak from experience in the sense that A, I work with this stuff, but I also make videos using it. So I've done mini documentaries, short films, lots and lots of interview videos, you know, for video for commercial purposes um and loads of kind of product explainer videos where it's kind of you know me and a bit of equipment and i've mic myself up in a variety of different ways i had to do them in millions of different places so hopefully i can speak from experience um and so uh, let's move on oh my butt isn't working there we go um so what we're going to learn today, a little more specifically, um, how to get pro audio on DSLRs and compact system cameras. Um, in this, I'm going to explain what the types of microphones are that you might want to own. I'm going to explain where you might want to put them. I'm going to explain how where you record makes a huge difference and considerations where you might like to record and where you might not. And I'm going to talk literally about camera settings and sort of the settings that you need to use in conjunction with your microphone so that you get a positive, good sounding result. And at the end, I will mention a little bit about some of the kind of post processing tools, some of the kind of other things that you might use um, in order to polish the recording that's hopefully great to start with. And I'll also talk about some of the things, tools that might save your bacon if you've not recorded audio very well. Um, not that I've ever failed to record audio fantastically. Uh, I have on many occasions, so I can talk again from experience about tools that will save your life. Um, and I think just the main consideration here is I, I am going to assume, um, and I think it will be a, an assumption that you will welcome, that you want your life to be easy. You want a simple solution that you possibly, you only, you might be the only videographer on a shoot that you can manage yourself. And so those are the solutions I'm going to talk about. Really simple things that just you by yourself might be able to use. So sound is more important than picture. Um, now that is a bit of a controversial statement, uh, especially since I'm you know, delivering it through uh, CVP, who sell many, many wonderful cameras. Um, and don't get me wrong, I love cameras, but sound is really important. There is no getting around that fact. Um, I think this is a Michael Moore quote. Michael Moore, obviously being a documentary filmmaker, you know, you're capturing sound out and about. You're capturing sound in sort of like strange environments, difficult scenarios. Sound is the thing that makes that picture watchable because the reality is you can have really, really great looking images, but if they have tinny, hissy sound, then the result is unwatchable and unprofessional. You know, you can't deliver that to someone and kind of expect to get paid for it. But the opposite, you know, if you do just have, um, you know, grainy sort of rough images or even images shot on you know lower cost cameras or you know without ideal light you can get away with those products or those the final result if the audio is clean and crisp and clear it does not work the other way around so sound is the essential link you can 
you have to have good sound. And if you obviously have great picture and good sound, then it just elevates things to an nth degree. I think a really good sort of, uh, you know, way of thinking about this is think about Star Wars, you know. Think about uh, James Earl Jones as the voice of Darth Vader versus Dave Prowse from um, the West Country doing the on-set dialogue. And you can actually, if you look on YouTube, you can find this really funny clip of, um, Dave doing the dialogue. He obviously did all the dialogue in the suit while they filmed. And it, you know, he's going like, well, you're a part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. And then you take that and you, then you put James or Jones' voice, you're booming and resonant and theatrical. And you've just got an iconic character. And I think it, it, that typifies and exemplifies how sound is powerful and important. So, um, and our job on the day is to capture in most cases, speech as cleanly as possible. So what I'm going to talk and focus on is capturing speech because that's the most important thing that you can capture. Uh, everything else can be faked. You know, you can, and, and people do. If you watch documentaries carefully, you will watch cuts happening in documentaries. And if you listen to the background noise, you'll hear it won't change. And that's because the background noise has been faked in. You know, it gets added in afterwards to create the kind of, you know, if you're in a jungle, you'll hear the jungle ambience and it's been added. And what the people on the day were doing was making sure they captured the people talking because that's very hard to recapture, you know. And of course, in films, they do re-record dialogue, but it's a difficult process. It's no, no one, I don't think, particularly enjoys the process. Having done it a few times, the, uh, no one had fun. Um, but, the, um, but so therefore, it's essential that you get a good dialogue on the day and of course in case of documentary you may well only have one shot so it's really important so to that end let's talk about good sound bad sound and i want to do a little sort of experiment i've got a couple of microphones here and i want to sort of show you or, or let you hear kind of what good and bad sound sounds like and all of the things that we will talk about will then relate to to this experiment so what you're hearing right now is a mic called an NTR. So this is a Rode microphone, it's a ribbon, it's a studio microphone, it's very posh, um, and it's lovely. And it's going through a nice, um, I've got the Rodecaster Pro, which is an audio processor in a mixing desk thing. But over here, I have got, so behind me is a little microphone, I'll go get it. This thing, which is an omnidirectional microphone, Omnidirectional, I will explain all this in a sec. Omnidirectional picks up sound in all directions equally. So you're hearing something that I would consider a sort of semi-approximation of the built-in sound on many cameras, because it's that type of microphone that most cameras have built in, um, and there's no selectivity. And compare that to this, where you have very close sound, obviously with a you know very posh microphone, but you're hearing very non-directional sound quite far away, you know. It's over here, it's more than an arm's length away from me versus the thing that's right up close. And then as one other quick test, I've got a Rode VideoMic Pro Plus here, which is a video mic, we were talking about this, um, and I can fade that one in. Hello. So that's the sound of the Rode VideoMic Pro. And you can kind of hear, I think there is some processing on here, but you get a sense that the, you know, it's a closer sound than that. But if I move this further away, give me a second, I'll move it out of shot. So now the Video Mode Pro is about five feet away. And what you can hear is that you're starting to get some of that kind of room echo again. It's not, um, you know, it doesn't magically sound like this sound, mic sounds right up close distance makes a huge difference even though the mic is selective and we'll talk about you know how it's selected it's focused and um, so let that illustrate the kind of two things one is that it's very important that you have a microphone and two it's very important where that microphone is so Here's why your camera doesn't sound so great by itself. And I, I feel a bit bad that I put a picture of a Canon. That is not related to anything. But all, no matter what the brand, um, all cameras can benefit from a dedicated mic solution. Um, and I'll give you exact reasons why. So um, 
one of the primary issues is that the microphone that's built into these cameras is not selective. So do you remember before when I played the microphone that was over here, um, it was echoey and roomy, and that's because it's picking up sound in all directions. It is omnidirectional. That literally means it picks up sound in every direction, from behind, from in front, from the sides. And so therefore, it's not going to focus the sound on a particular subject. So of course, the VideoMic Pro does have the capability to focus sound more. Um, and we can talk more about those in a sec, but it does. And unfortunately, these cameras do not. The other issue is the issue of closeness. Now, if I was to take um, this microphone, and we should maybe do this as an experiment. If I then speak closely into it like this, you hear you get a much, much better sound than if I'm further away. So in this sense, one of the problems that we have with our cameras is that the mic is attached to the camera. I can't take away the mic part of my camera and put it close to the person. And very often, especially if you're using these cameras, you will know that you have to use lenses that mean you need to be further away, especially in the case of crop sensor cameras. You know, you do need to be further to get uh, an image that's wide enough to fit a person in, in some instances, depending on how much you spent on your lenses. Um, so the issue is that we can't get the mic closer than the camera is. And that means that we're totally at the mercy of the echoiness of the room itself. The other thing is that there's no wind protection on a, you know, on a camera. And so wind is obviously a huge issue. And wind, when it gets into the capsule, blows onto the little diaphragm inside and causes that kind of flumping, windy sound, which will ruin recordings. And one of the benefits of using a dedicated mic is they they have options to put dead cats or, or uh, wind covers on them so that they are wind protected, um, which is critical. You do need to do that if you're outside. You don't really need to do that if you're inside unless you're talking directly into the end of the mic. In most instances, these mics have foam on them to help sort of stop a little bit of wind. But if you're shooting outside, if you've got a dedicated mic, you can wind protect it and you can't really do that with your camera. And then the other thing with the cameras by themselves is that they don't tend not to have professional inputs. And by professional, I mean XLR. So these are the types of inputs that are used with kind of higher end shotgun microphones. Um, and in short, you know, that kind of cuts off a lot of pro microphones, quote unquote. Um, and so it's important that we use a microphone that is compatible with our cameras if we want to just get the audio directly into the camera. Um, and we'll look at ones that let us do this. But it, it's a limitation, so it, it affects what we can buy. So you've obviously been getting a bit of a hint at this, but I'm just going to cut straight to the chase. Um, here is the secret to amazing audio in just 15 words. Buy the best microphone you can afford, could be any brand, and get it as close as you can. That genuinely is the secret to audio. And if you do anything else, it's get the microphone closer. That is the fact that will solve 99.9% .9 of problems that you have or you may encounter with getting close professional sound. So you have to buy something because you have to have something that you can get closer and you have to get it close. That's how you get make it sound good. So it isn't reductionist. That's actually the secret. And things like um, hiss, for example, you know, things like room echo, um, you know, things like thin sound, you know, those all come from the microphone being far away. Hiss, for example, can come from the fact that because the mic's far away and my voice is not the loudest voice in the world, you've got to turn up the volume or the level of your camera. And as you turn it up, the camera introduces its own hiss, as well as a little bit of hiss that is in the microphone itself, as all of them have some. Um, and so if you get the microphone closer, you can turn levels down and hiss goes down as well. So everything pretty much can be solved. Uh, perhaps not the world's problems, but certainly your audio problems can be solved by getting the mic close. So how do we get mics close? Um, and so this is where we start choosing a microphone. So 
you know very likely that on your side of your camera is a little three and a half millimeter jack input. That's a little headphone-y type socket that will probably be labeled mic. Um, and the solutions that we're going to look at today are designed for that type of input. Um, there are manufacturers like Fuji, I think, have put 2.5 millimeter jacks on some of their cameras. You can still use these other solutions with those. You just get an adapter that converts from 2.5 millimeter to 3.5 millimeter. There's nothing magic about 2.5, um, but just yeah, bear in mind there is a solution. Um, so three choices, basically, in effect. Um, one is a, what is called a mono shotgun. The other are stereo microphones. And then the third are Lavalier tie clip or things like the Wireless Go digital wireless systems. Um, and so the question is, which scenarios? Why would I want either or any of these? So in simplistic terms, you would want a mono shotgun microphone to capture speech. So, and I'll get the other mic so we've got it to look at. But a mono shotgun microphone, shotguns, which have this slight kind of barrel shape, um, what they do is they pick up sound in a kind of ice cream cone. So if you imagine a kind of cone coming off the, the end of the microphone, and it really is just like a, a cone, um, just expanding outwards, that's their pickup pattern. And the length of the barrel is what determines how directional they are. There are really high-end kind of pro microphones you can get that are ludicrously long, that look like kind of um, batons, you know. And those are designed for absolutely selective audio. The longer they are, even to a ridiculous standard, the more directional they are. And in short, that's because sound has to, if it comes from the side, it is cancelled out. And if it's pointing straight at the microphone, then it goes straight down the barrel and it hits the capsule at the end that actually captures the sound. So the sound has to be straight on to make it all the way down the barrel. And that's how they become directional. So length is a factor. Um, and so, yeah, mono shotgun. You would want this because when you point it at a person, you hear the person, you hear less of the environment. It is important to say you will hear some of the environment because if you can almost imagine taking space, any part of a room, and chopping it up as if it was a real physical object, you know, sound bounces around in rooms and every part of the room will have some sound in it. So it's not kind of magic in that sense. It doesn't um, do what would happen if you went into a totally silent studio and whispered into a microphone, you know, that kind of silence of other elements. But um, it is vastly reduced. And it means that when you point at something, you hear proportionally more of them. And it allows you to focus on the speaking subject in a way. And, and it still sounds natural. You will still have some ambience. And it's and it, it, hence, for that reason, this is kind of the primary choice. You will see mono shotgun microphones being used to capture speech in kind of 99% of times. Um, and in the kind of quote unquote pro world, you know, you, you get shotgun mics that are this long, that are on big booms. When you see professional film sets with those, with kind of blimps, you know, that have mics in, it's this type of microphone that is inside one. And, and the only difference between a video mic and one of those is the fact that the video mic has the kind of associated um, pre-amplifier and kind of electronics gubbins to make the mic audible and to, for it to go straight into a camera uh, built in. Apart from that, it works just like those other, you know, other microphones do in principle. And so it's ideal for speech. It focuses on the speaking subject. It minimizes other things. But a stereo microphone, I would choose to use a stereo microphone in kind of all other shooting environments. So if, for example, I was filming a wedding band and they were you know, the band is playing and I wanted to kind of capture the, the the ambience of them playing and the room itself, I would use a stereo microphone. And actually in a wedding scenario, say, if I was like moving through a crowd and I was getting a shot of kind of all the guests mingling, I would love to use a stereo microphone because it's got two microphones inside it and it works like your ears work. And so when someone says something to the right, it sounds like they're on the right when you watch the, the video back. Um, and so, in short, you would use a stereo microphone for ambience and for music. 
But say I was shooting that wedding, uh, then I would swap to the mono shotgun mic when I spoke to a guest and was like, hey, would you like to do a sort of piece to the bride and groom? Um, I'd, I'd change my mic, I'd swap over to the mono shotgun because now that they're speaking, I just want to focus on them. And so that hopefully will give you a sense that there is sort of almost two different types of shooting and you need two different microphones to capture them. Um, you can use a stereo microphone to try and capture speech, but you will hear more of the environment. It will be harder to focus on the speaking subject. And you can hear, use a mono shotgun to capture environments. Um, but just bear in mind, it doesn't have quite the same immersive quality. But we are very used to watching mono content. Um, you know, most of us are kind of putting speakers in our houses that are all mono, you know, these single kind of, you know, Amazon sort of echo type jobbies. Um, those are all mono. Um, people are fairly used to it. It doesn't sound unnatural. Um, and I should also say that when these microphones are plugged into a camera, um, it's um, a given, and it's not a silly question because I've been asked this many times, um, that even though they're mono, which means there's one channel, it will plug, put that into both the left and the right equally in your finished video recording. Um, so it's kind of, it technically has a stereo output. And then the Lavalier and wireless sort of concept is the type of microphone that attaches to a person. And in the case of the Lavalier, what we see here is the SmartLav Plus. There's actually a, like a tie clip microphone that you can plug directly into a phone. If you give me a sec, I have one. Um, and so, yeah, it's like a little um, tie clip jobby that goes on the person. And then this can go straight into your phone. Um, of course, I've got an iPhone, so I don't have the headphone jack, but that's okay because I also have the adapter. And so you can just plug this in and then that becomes um, able to go into an iPhone. We have an app called Reporter, which is free, which is a really good app, it's just very simple. It's like a big red button that records and it records in very high quality. So it records in, um, WAV, you know, broadcast WAV quality. It can actually also record MP3 if you want to do super long recordings and you haven't got um, enough space on your phone. But in this way, you can use your phone as a sort of remote recording system and you can put it on the person and you can send them off to the other side of the room and they can be filmed talking. And because the microphone is close, you will always have close up sound. I mean, they could literally get in a plane and fly to Australia and go and visit the road factory and you'd still get close audio because the mic was attached to them. Um, and so, and this is kind of the, one of the biggest takeaways is, um, it's important to get the best microphone you can afford, yes. But also, um, I would rather use this, which costs £45, than our NTG um, 4, which costs £450, if the person was on the other side of the room. Because the, unfortunately, the shotgun is not designed. It cannot zap sound from one side of the room from 40 feet away. But this thing will sound better because it's so much closer. So closeness is the key factor in all of this. And so you need the microphone that lets you get close. Um, and I mentioned the wireless go, uh, that is this little wireless system, which many, many, many people have been purchasing. So I'm sure you know about this. Um, but in short, this is like a radio system. Well, it's technically not, it's digital. Um, that goes on your camera, you turn these things on, that clips to the person. And just in the same way as the um, smart lav, the other person can walk off and that the audio is being beamed to your camera. Uh, and in this way, you get close audio. That's why people use these things to get close. So um, you pick the mic that will suit the scenario. So what mic settings to use? So we'll talk a bit about how do we actually use these things we've now bought. Um, hopefully. And so first, a little word on the human sort of science, because there's an interesting sort of plot here. You can see that the human voice occupies a part of the frequency spectrum. Um, and so frequency spectrum refers to the sort of um, kind of range of possible sound um, pitch. Um, just like in um, you know images you have from complete you know, absolute black to 
total whiteness, you have a sound spectrum that goes from the absolute lowest possible sound to the highest Tweety Bird sound. And the human voice occupies a kind of curve on that, on that spectrum. And it's important to know this because it helps you understand what the settings on your camera does do. And also when it comes to processing at the end of the day, you know, processing the audio, which is kind of like taking a, you know, a, a nice looking raw photo, but then doing all of the tweaking in, um, you know, Lightroom to, to finalize it. The same thing is done with sound. You know, you can tweak things and finalize them. And what you see from that plot is a blue and a red uh, line. And the blue is, in a very general sense, how the male voices tend to fall on that spectrum. Male voices tend to be lower and female voices tend to be a little higher. Um, and that becomes important when we talk about settings. So here's the picture of the back of a video mic. Um, and again, um, whilst it's a video mic I'm showing, any of the camera manufacturer, many of them have similar kinds of settings. So there are many things that would be common no matter what you own. Um, but I want to talk about a general rule regarding levels. And this is really important, almost as important, in fact, probably as important as getting close. And this is a kind of general rule to do with how to set up the volume levels. And the rule is that you should make the microphone as loud as possible and you should work backwards from the microphone to adjust everything else accordingly. So what I mean by this is that you have volume settings on your um, camera, on, on, your, on your camera, and you also have volume settings on your mic. Do you remember before when I mentioned the fact that if something was further away, you may well have to turn up the volume level on your camera for it to be heard. What can happen is that Obviously, camera manufacturers have put most of the kind of pound value of the camera into the imaging side of it. And the audio isn't necessarily the, the finest or strongest point of the product. It isn't an afterthought. It's just not where most of your money that you're paying for rightly goes. Um, and unfortunately, what you can find is that if you do have to turn up the level of your um audio settings, this is in movie, you know, movie settings on your camera, then it will introduce hiss beyond a certain point. And so Rode, being an audio company, obviously have um, designed these products so that they kind of compensate and do more of the heavy lifting so that your camera can kind of rest easy and we can reduce this. Um, and the, one of the primary settings on here is where it says plus 20. So the plus 20 is making the microphone sensitive or loud in want of a better term. It's exactly the same thing as ISO on a camera. It's sensitivity to sound. And by pressing, pushing plus 20, you make the microphone more sensitive. But it's going to, and basically what it will do is it will increase the output volume of the uh, microphone but because Rode are an audio company, because Rode have invested, you know, you're paying most of your pound value goes into the audio settings of this device. It means that that plus 20 isn't hissy. It's nice and loud and clear. And then what you do is you turn down your camera settings to compensate. Um, and so when I say what you should do is you should make the mic as loud as possible and work backwards, then that's what I mean. It means in most scenarios, on most cameras, you probably do want to have plus 20 on. And you only want to turn down plus 20 when something is so loud that you can't get everything quiet, in, quiet enough unless you do that. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Plus 20 should probably be on if it exists and you adjust everything to compensate. We'll talk a little bit about the camera settings in a second, but I'm starting with the microphone. And then the other thing is the minus 10, and that's called a pad in some instances. Some things like you can see the picture of the um, video, my, of the, sorry, the NTG uh, 4. Uh, it's a 4 or a 4 plus. 
can't tell which one from here, but the NTG4 has a separate button that says minus 10. So that's the same thing that's on the back of the video mic there, but the, it's just differently labeled. And what that's doing is reducing sensitivity. It's like, you know, ISO 100. It's making it very non-sensitive to sound, not light, but sound in this instance, so that you could record something really loud. Because if you go and stand next to a, you know, you're a rock concert and you put plus 20 on, it'll be too loud. You will never be able to get the camera low enough um, to get a result that isn't blasting out the meters that we'll look at in a sec. Um, so minus 10 really exists for loud sounds. And, um, you know, and I guess in speech it exists for Brian Blessed. It's there to, to record him exclusively, I think. Um, so, yes. Yeah. And so... The other setting, which is on the back of the video mic, is that thing that looks like a little sort of slope, um, a sort of R, you know? And what is that? Well, the R is a high-pass filter. So in, you know, remember I was talking about frequency spectrum. So we were looking before at the human voice. And the reason I mentioned that is because that has a massive bearing on high-pass filters. So... If you look, you can see that there's a low kind of um, peak on these voices. And beyond that, it doesn't exist. The human voice does not go any lower than that. However, other things do. So things like cars, things like motorbikes, you know, things, even when a car is, you know, three or four rooms away on the street, you know, you can still, or the, the mic is sensitive, it can still hear bass, bass will always tend to get into the capsule, um, no matter what direction it comes from. It's uh, it's sort of a defeats directionality. And so bass can be a real problem. Also, if you brush the mic, you know, by accident, you touch microphones, it can create a kind of loud, low, low end sound. And depending on what you're editing with and what speakers you have, it's entirely possible. You could go through the whole process of recording something to editing it to um, finishing off and then not realize that there's this kind of crazy, like low end on your audio. And what a high pass filter does is it just cuts all that out. And it's designed specifically to cut out below the human voice. So when you see it says that the high pass filter is set to 80 hertz, 80 hertz, you can see there is just below where that blue line falls away. That's the end of the, the deepest of human voice. And so in short, high pass filters are designed to kind of clean up video audio at the point of capture. You can use filters in, you know, Premiere to get rid of them afterwards, but it's just generally easier to just leave them on. Um, and you know that it isn't going to touch any of the actual human voice. The only time you might want to leave it off is if you are capturing something that's very bassy and you do want to hear that bassiness. You know, if I was recording a, the wedding band again, I definitely wouldn't put the high pass filter on. I'd let it kind of cut through so we got the full you know, performance. Uh, and perhaps I would still do a little bit of high passing in, um, you know, in the final edit, uh, but I wouldn't turn it on on there. So it exists to clean up everything below speech. If what you're capturing is, is speech, you can just leave it on and not, you know, get on with your day. Cool. What camera settings to use? So here's the sad bit. I feel sad telling you this, but I've told so many people this and they're always annoyed, uh, is that you, you can't leave the auto on, on the sound recording on your camera. You know, that you will have some variation of this menu on your camera, you know, no matter what the brand, because um, it makes sense from a manufacturer's standpoint is just put it on automatic so that when someone receives a camera, it just, it works as well as it could without any interference. The problem with the auto setting on these um on the cameras is that they are always trying to, well, let me put it like this. They're like, they're like having a little kid that has got hold of the volume control of your TV. And whenever someone isn't speaking, the kid is trying to turn up the volume to hear the person speaking. But because no one is speaking, what they're doing is they're amplifying silence. And so you end up with this kind of very like unprofessional, hissy sort of, compressed sort of sound um, and we'll, we'll mention what compressors are at the end but it's a kind of it is a form of compression and compression can be used well and it can be used um, poorly and unfortunately 
AGC auto gain compensation as a general rule will not help you. Um, and for that reason, it will make your sound sound kind of like pumped and strange and hissy. When someone isn't speaking, you want it to be silent and it won't be if you have AGC on. So you have to set it to manual. Now, um, that means that you do have to set the recording level. So there is a, a setting that you've got to adjust that. That is the input sensitivity of the camera. And it's the same thing that we have on the back of the um, microphone, but the camera variant. There are more notches. There are many, many notches. Um, and so it, it is another step you have to do, but you've got to do it. It's just like when you film and you use manual lenses and you have to focus and you have to pull, you know, adjust the iris and you have to actually just know how to adjust those settings. This is one thing you do have to do. But I'll explain the process and it's very, very, very simple. Remember before, you make your microphone as loud as you can get away with. So if I was filming, here's what I would do. I would set this to plus 20. So that's the loudest I can make it. And I would put the high pass on. And then I would go to my camera and I would go into the movie settings. I would learn where those are so I can quickly get to them and be like, right, here we are. And then I would say, Alex, can you just give me a bit of level? Just talk a bit. And I would go, yep, hi, um, I'm Alex. I'm here to talk about camera settings. And you will see that the meters, which are the little sort of dotted things, will jump around. And the question is, what? How, where is the right level for them to jump to? Because what you will discover is where you adjust the rec level, they'll move. So they'll only go up to a certain height, depending on where the rec level is. And that's just adjusting the sensitivity. Um, so you want to generally, as a general rule, have them when someone is at the loudest that they will be when you film them, it should be about three quarters of the way across the meters as an extremely general rule. Um, to be more technical, you would want to hit about minus 12 decibels. Um, and you can actually see on this Canon, it does say dB and there is 12 is marked. And that's because that's the level that you want to be aiming for. And it is OK to go a little smidge over 12. You know, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to ruin the recording, but it may well ruin the recording if it goes right to the end. So you're watching this, you're seeing the ballistics of the, the meters jumping and you're saying, hey, that's about three quarters. And I, I never go beyond that. I never go to that last sort of, you know, quarter. And if that's the case, you're pretty much good. Like, you know that the level is good. You can tell that without even having to listen to the audio because you can see. What would happen if the plus 20 was too loud um, is that the meters would always be slammed to the end. And no matter how much you turn down the rec level, they would always slam right to the end, you know. And that tells you, hey, either... A, the thing I'm recording is way too loud. Brian Blessed needs to quieten down. Or B, I need to turn plus 20 off. And there's actually a zero setting. And then there's that minus 12, that, uh, minus 10 that I talked about where you would record a rock band at. So does that make sense? So you're making, make the mic as loud as possible and then adjust the camera to compensate. And these are the, there is, is a bit of a kind of dance it's like the dance between your lens and iso you know the camera's um, sensitivity itself it's the same thing but just for sound um, this is the lens your camera is the sensor as it were um cool actually one i'm going to mention a road feature because it's quite cool is that the video mic pro plus has got a safety track um, I mention that just because sometimes it bears explaining. Safety track is based on the fact that it records at two levels at once. So it records at the level you tell it to, the plus 20. But in the left channel, I think it is, or it might be the right, it's always about 10 decibels quieter. So it means that you can set for this, but if something loud happens and distorts that channel, then you've still got, a, a, you've hopefully at least, if it wasn't that loud, you've still got it on the opposite channel um, and it's a way of having recording at two levels at once. It's a really cool feature. So, But you don't technically need that, but you need to do this and make sure it's set up correctly. So let's kind of do a bit of a kind of recap um, and we'll talk about some examples of 
um, Stanley Kubrick films because they kind of exemplify all of the things that we've been talking about. And hopefully that will just kind of, um, you know, solidify it. So here we have three different filming scenarios from um, three different Stanley... No, two different Stanley Kubrick films. Um, I love Kubrick. And so you can see in the first one, this is when Stanley Kubrick is filming The Shining in the ballroom and Vivian Kubrick is there. You can see she has got a documentary, like a over-the-shoulder video, a film camera, and she's got a shotgun and it's on the camera. And... I've, you know, I've talked a lot in this about the fact that you've got to get it close, you've got to get it off the camera, um, and we'll talk about a product that lets you do that. Um, well, we'll do that in a sec when we're talking about the next scenario. But um, there's nothing wrong with that shooting style if that's all that you can do. You know, it's a brilliant example that Vivian is a single person filming a documentary about the making of The Shining, and so she doesn't have a sound person. She has to do it all herself. So it's fine and it gets the result and if you watch that documentary which is on youtube it's great uh it sounds great it's great uh and so there's you know it's not a problem um but what it is is it's an illustration that that is a very valid way of doing things but it's not the only way of doing things and ultimately whatever lets you get closest the easiest is the way to do it so in the middle you see them filming a clockwork orange and Remember we mentioned they're like crazy long shotguns. Well, that is one of them. That is a that'll probably be some Sennheiser or something, but it's uh, from before Rhodes time, bless him. But um, it is a sh mega shotgun. It's very long, so it's very directional. But look, it's still very close. And what they are doing is they're using a boom to get the mic over the camera and close. So even though they've got this really posh shotgun microphone, they are getting it off the camera and closer and that's to get you know cinematic dialogue you know usable cinematic dialogue that will be the primary audio for the film as it will be enjoyed for the next 50 years that's what you have to do um, and to that end i will mention that um you need you do need one of these in some form so a boom pole is the name of a kind of telescoping device where you can extend this and what is cool is that every video mic has on the bottom of it, I can't, this is, I'll talk about this in a sec, but I can't annoyingly take this off that easily. Um, but they all have the thread that a boom pole is compatible with on the bottom of them. So, you know, if I unscrew this, I can just screw it directly into a boom pole. And then there's an extension cable called a VC1. And that's like a three meter, three and a half millimeter jack cable. And it allows me to run the audio is still into my camera, but I can have it on a boom and I can hold it over just out of shot and get it nice and close to the speaking subject. Um, what you see here is a slightly different setup where I've got a Rode tripod, which is a Rode accessory. It's like a desk tripod, which I discovered to my absolute delight. Um, I don't think this is that common knowledge, is if you take a Rode tripod and unscrew it, the bottom, which is this little telescoping thing, that comes off and you can keep that for, for later use. And then this has got the um, thread for a mic boom. So this is a, you know, music recording. This is just a standard mic boom. You can get these for like 25 quid. Um, very, very affordable device. And what's cool about them is they telescope. And so you can actually use them as a kind of, um, you know, helping hand. And I film videos where I've had this set up on a mic boom. It's a really easy way of doing it. So in that way, you can almost have a, you know, a robotic boom operator. Um, but, you know, these boom poles, there are many different ones. The cheapest ones, like under £45. And the extension cable is like under £15. You know, we're not talking a sort of crazy investment, but they will, you know, easily double, if not quadruple the quality of your audio because they'll let you get it close. And they work with all of the video mics and you don't need to buy like the blimp, you know, any other attachment to sort of dampen the, the noise, you know, type thing, because that's all built in on the mic itself. So... Um, you might want to use it on the camera. That might be the way that makes sense and that's totally cool and people do it. You... If you have the option, it sounds better. If you have it on the boom, it is better. And it's what they do in professional films. And you can do it too with the video mics. Um, 
And then the third one is, should we put it on the person? Should we use Lavalier, um, you know, or a, a digital wireless system or a wireless system? And that depends on the shooting scenario. The simple fact is, if you can't get your video mic within arm's length, that is the that's the, the the sort of test. If it's not within arm's length, if you cannot get it from within arm's length, then you should be using a lavalier, I would say, to get the best possible sound. And what's this is such a good example because it's you know they're filming. Um, you know, Shelley Duvall running through the maze and all this stuff. The camera's very wide. The, the, everything with the one's moving. It's very mobile. There's no way you can have a boom operator operating that scenario. You know, they wouldn't be able to keep up and the boom would most likely appear in shot. So they hide microphones on people. Um, you know, you can see Jack Nicholson. This is from Vivian's documentary, pulling out the, uh, the radio system that was hidden on him. Uh, and that's how they did it. And you can hide it under clothing so you don't get rustle and sort of um, wind noise and things like that. Um, but what I hope this illustrates is that you you kind of want to have a little bag of tricks. You want to have a couple of different microphones to cover these. These are the three sort of scenarios that you will generally encounter. Um, and, you know, if at the very bare minimum, if you had a mono shotgun and some kind of wireless solution, then that will cover most scenarios um, and the most important thing is the tool that lets you get closest so i'll do a quick kind of recap on the process you've got to use a mic um, that is use a stereo mic for ambience shotgun style or a lav for speech find a quiet place to record i didn't sort of mention that so much but you know um, that's really important is this the room you know the room you're in if you go into a room and clap you can hear a kind of echo. There's a report. When you go into a like a living room with loads of soft furnishings and you clap, and then go into your bathroom and clap, you'll hear that difference. Um, and that tells you how noisy a place is. And I can tell you from experience as well, um, you know, the human ear is amazing and we tune a lot of that out. We don't really pay attention to it. But my goodness, you do hear it when you use microphones because suddenly when you're listening to stuff kind of like, you know, really amplified and you're really tight into it, then you're like, wow, no, I really, I really can hear the, you know, everything. Uh, I can hear this echo. And so um, what I would say is bear in mind that you can tell people to go and film in another room. It could be, you know, someone says, hey, you, and I've had this on many occasions, it's like, can we film in, you know, is this fine for the interview? I'm, and I've had to say, no, I'm really sorry. And I don't, I hate to be annoying, but have you got a quieter room? There's people walking through here, et cetera, et cetera. So don't be afraid to ask for a quieter place. Um, and that can also mean the, the liveliness of the room in terms of its echo. Um, so you have to set your camera to manual. You can't have audio gain compensation on. You have to make your mic loud as loud as it can be for that particular scenario. Put on high pass. As a general rule, if you're recording dialogue, it's fine. Really, you only need to turn it off when you're recording music. Um, get the mic within an arm's length. That's what I would consider close. Any further away and you'll really start to hear the room. And get your subject to speak, test a bit, and then check your levels. Are you hitting about three quarters of the way up? AKA minus 12 dB. And if you do have the luxury, record a test, plug in your headphones and listen back to it. And if it sounds good, it's good. Uh, there's not, you know, you don't need to sort of doubt yourself enormously. If it sounds good, it's good. Um, and there are things that we can do to clean up. And, and so we'll finish by kind of talking quickly about these things. I'm not going to go into them because actually um, I'm doing another talk, um, which is going to be about EQ, compression, dialogue, denoising and stuff like that. So, um, well, then, Oh, go on, is Alex, it? we've got some questions in the box. I don't know if you want to just have a quick look at them now because um, some of them were to do with placing of the, I can't say, I'm really sorry, I can't say the lab, you Lavalier. know the one I'm on about because we discussed it. Yeah. Um, Yes. Um, sorry, I'm just going to pull up the questions. Um, so anonymous. So one of go on. yeah, go for it. Oh, okay. So um, anonymous attendee asks, uh, "Thank you, anonymous. Uh, how do you hide a lav on a person without hearing rustling?" Uh, that is a good question. So um, rustling refers to the fact that obviously, when if a lav is placed badly, it can touch 
if you touch that little like foam, it's like this. Uh, so it is a problem. That is that is an issue. Um, so, you know, how you do it without hearing the rustling Ideally, it's visible to you so that you're placing it on the clothing. You can place it so it's upside down or right side up. It doesn't make any difference because it's omnidirectional. It picks up sound in every direction. So whichever way you need to position it on their clothing so that it is kind of the mic is in free and open space. And it kind of just you you would know when you saw the clothing, as long as it's placed in a way and you really need to be wearing a shirt is the problem. There is a little adapter that a uh, road cell called a vampire clip that literally is like a little vampire sort of claws and it can pin down over um, a T-shirt. So you can kind of like hover a, um, a mic in the center of a T-shirt. And there is also, um, there's a mag adapter called a mag clip that magnets, it's basically a magnet attached to the back and then there's a counterpart that clinks into the clothing. But the short answer is make sure it's in free space. The longer answer is the, I forget the name of it, but if you if you go on YouTube, there is a way of making by folding um, uh, duct tape into little triangles, you can make a little sandwich, put it in the center, sandwich it, and then you can sandwich it between clothing. The only thing is that some people are allergic to the adhesive of duct tape. And so Rode have a product which is called a, a Invisilav. And the Invisilav is like a surgical grade kind of um, insert. And it's made from a material that is skin safe, dermatologically proven. And the adhesive is skin safe because, again, people are some people are allergic. And you find out in a very upsetting way that they are allergic to the thing you've stuck them on them. So, um, but the short answer is make sure it's in free space. You can make a sandwich with duct tape and sandwich it in clothing and that really holds it in place and it doesn't rustle. But ideally in Visilav, uh, you can get three and 10 packs. It's not a lot of money and it, you know, they're, you know, they work and they're safe. Um, and then another, do, sorry, is it? Do you find that if you point the mic in a particular direction, whether it's down towards the diaphragm or up towards the mouth, it makes a difference or? No, it shouldn't. It, so the the only thing is regarding placement is you kind of want to have it in the center of the person's chest and that's so that the you know what the only problem can be if it's a if it's too far away but it's unlikely you would do that but what you might do is put it right under the chin and as you move further up the chin actually obscures the um, speaking voice and you hear a kind of dulling of the sound you can kind of compensate a little with EQ and compression which we can talk about but it doesn't make a difference which way up it is. It should sound the same. You can do a test and, and hear for yourself. Um, but you do want to have it, don't have it too high. That's the only problem. Um, and then um, another anonymous attendee asks, is DSLR camera audio processing good enough now? Or should I use a separate external recorder? Um, and so in this, we have talked exclusively about DSLR audio processing. And what I would say is I have used video mics on videos that have over, a, actually a video just passed a million views, which is small fry in the sort of YouTube world, but um, I was very pleased. And I recorded the speech for that on a video mic pro. And, you know, a million views later, no one is like complaining. And that was, that's probably five years ago that I did that. Um, if you use plus 20, I think the results are perfectly professional and usable. However, yeah, I think you can get a kind of like fuller, silkier, more sort of pro sound with the bigger mics, um, but they require more equipment. You do need external recorders. And the almost the worst bit is that they require more personnel, you know, because they need you to work with them to set them up correctly and to um you know someone has to be responsible for them so the, the results i think are better but i think the results that you can get by with yourself and one of these in the right place are absolutely professional i've used them on videos that have you know millions of views so it's all million views <laughs> so do you know what i mean it's like it's a question of convenience um so um okay cool um a few more questions very quickly so sharice asks doing a shoot in a car what would you recommend in terms of mics and placements would labs be the way to go that is a good question i guess if it's a shoot in a car it might be a film you might be trying to hide them there are two 
if you look on Rhodes YouTube, they've done some videos about miking up in cars. Actually, quite a few different videos. So have a little like look round. But there's a, two fun things. One fun thing is well, you can just hide them on the, the person. Labs will sound great um, because a car is very dead as well, and it's you know it's a very dead environment. It will sound nice and close and good. You can also put the labs, tuck them into the um, uh, sun mirror flaps. The sun mirror flaps. Why can't I think of what those are called? Sun visors? Wow. Uh, but yeah, the the flaps that you pull down to blind you from or to stop the sun from getting in your eyes. You can hide them, tape them to that, and they won't be in shot, but they'll be quite close to the speaking subject. Um, and you can hide other mics. I actually recorded a podcast in a car and I put pencil microphones um, in those flaps. Um, so... <laughs> um, Another anonymous attendee asked, my mic has two high-pass settings, 75 and 150. Very good question, because I forgot to mention the whole reason that 150 and 75 exist um, is that the 75 was for male voices, 150 is for female voices. Because they go higher, you can have the high-pass a bit higher and you won't affect the voice. So it's designed to compensate or to work with the sort of two different uh, depths of speech, as it were. Um, mm -mm. So, oh, John asks, what is pad off on recap slide point three? Um, pad, um, what I mean by pad off is on some microphones, they have a separate pad switch. And if you've got that on and you haven't realized, then you're making the mic less sensitive. So it's just be mindful of when there's a separate pad control, make sure it's off if you want it to be off. Um, on the video mics, the, some of them have that. This one does. On the Video Mic Pro, it's just one slider that kind of moves you through this. So you won't get that wrong. But it's just in case you have a separate pad control, be mindful. Excuse me. Um, Hugh John asks, hi both. I have just bought a Rode Video Mic uh, Go, I assume Wireless Go or Video Mic Go, to add to my Video Mic Pro for the general Atmos. Is a good way to link use these together, the new DC Micro Pro box, and pass it out to a Ninja V? That would be very good. Um, I can give you a very, very low cost and a new solution, which is that Rode have got a two new products. <laughs> Um, which costs considerably less than the things that you've mentioned, but I'm just, just to say, is the DCS-1, which is a dual cold shoe, and an SC-11. I hope I've got that right, but the I think it's the SC-11, and it's a dual splitter, and it has two um, mini jacks going to one stereo jack. So you can plug the stereo jack into your camera, and the two splitters could go to your various microphones. So you can have two microphones into one camera going into the left and right. Um, but obviously, yeah, if you have um, Atomos and like good recorders like that, you can use these with them. By the way, these plug into XLRs using an adapter called a VXLR. You can get a mini jack to XLR adapter uh, for not a lot of money, and then you can plug them into professional recorders. Um, yes, uh, John also asks, uh, could you put a lav on the peak of a baseball cap? Okay, that's a good question. I think it would be, yes, you could, because I mean, it would be, I remember reading about when they recorded Les Miserables and they were doing tests on how to set up microphones to record singing using lavs. They discovered the best possible sound that they could get with a lav was to have the lav taped to their foreheads. Um, and they discovered it sounded incredible. Uh, but the problem was then hiding lavaliers in foreheads and you have to have sort of prosthetic foreheads, which is um, fine if you're making Star Trek, but not so much if you're making <laughs> sort of, you know... Um, kind of period piece so um yes hopefully that answers your questions eq and compression then we will sort of I, oh god can i just pop two more in so there's some in the chat and i just want um i've got two um hey can you can the lavalier mics i know now if i said that right yeah. when plugged into a smartphone do do used when go do do you use when doing a live stream on social Yes. Uh, as in, can you plug a, you can plug, yeah, you basically, if you, what have I done with it? Um, but yeah, if you have one of these things and um, it is plugged into your um, iPhone, it will replace the built-in um, audio. Now, um, 
what you might find though is you may want to use headphones as well so it will replace the built-in audio so you will sound great but you won't be able to hear them back with just the thing plugged in directly however there are other road things that let you do that um, one of which is called an sc6 as in sierra charlie 6 um, which is like a very low cost little analog um, adapter that has it has the little jack end and it has a socket that you can plug a smart lab into in fact you can plug two in and then it also has a headphone so it makes the headphone port accessible whilst also plugging in the smart lab and it's called an sc6 and then there is a kind of grander version which I actually have here this is called an sc6l and this little adapter same idea where it's got two smart lab inputs and a headphone port but this one's got a lightning connector um, and you can actually buy what's called the SC6L interview kit and you get two, two smart labs and one of those. And that means that you can record two people interviews directly to your phone. You could live stream, you can be hearing what people are saying to you, you know, chatting to, to guests and whatnot. Um, uh, it's just a very simple and you can also record um, with separation. So if you use that reporter app, you can have two people being recorded with labs with separation, which is really cool. Um, so, there, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Sorry, was there another? There was one more, if yeah. that's OK. Yeah. Um, hi there. I'm currently, uh, this might sort of link into the last one a little bit, actually, now. But hi there. I currently own a Sony A6000 as a vlog camera. Sometimes is used on set for interviews and various things. Open brackets, mostly chatter and Q&A, close brackets. The camera doesn't have an input jack for mic, etc. What can you recommend me in this case? Should I really change camera or buy the only two slash three available non aux mics, but with no really good quality mics? Hmm. So the, that, I thought the A six thousand does that because I've been I've I been co- yeah I've been coveting those really quite covetously. Cover covetously. Um, just because I literally I was looking at, I have the A7S and so I'm in the Sony stable too um, but I think the A6000 does have a headphone input um, but I may be wrong I have got suggestions obviously if you if it doesn't oh yeah it does say no headphone jack but does it have a mic jack is that what we're getting at I think it's saying there's no mic jack but I'm just checking it out. Bear with me. Because it, it is, yeah, not having a headphone jack is relatively common. I mean, I used to have the, um, you know, the Canon 550D way back. Um, that, yeah, you um, say no mic jack. But right. I'm just, but like, um, bear with me. I'm just checking on our system. So um, the short answer, I mean, it's worth talking about, well, what would you do if you couldn't record directly to um, the camera and for whatever reason? And so... Uh, the answer is you need a you have to have a separate recorder in that instance. You have to have another device that will do the audio recording. Um, and what's involved is is simply to record the audio separately. Um, and as a good rule of thumb is the the classic thing of clapping. You clap at the start of your takes or whatever session you're recording, and that just gives you a very clear visual indicator on the um, you know to line up the direct recorded audio or the separately recorded audio with your camera footage. You know, your camera will be recording a kind of loud and echoey version of, of your sound. We know this, but it's it will be enough to line the two up. Um, and you can obviously use your phone as a separate recorder if you have something like the SC6L interview kit, or if you have, um, for example, we also have like adapters. So this is the Videomic Pro. Um, It has a normal, quote unquote, uh, 3.5 millimeter jack, which has two little connectors here. Now, I don't know if I have um, a TR. Oh, I do. Yes, of course, because there's one on the smart lab. So what you have on your phone is this, which is a bit blurry. But trust me, there are four rings here and there are three on this one. And we, we do adapters. So you can adapt each of those types for the other one. So what you would have, so if you want to plug a video mic into a phone, then you can do that. And you need the SC4. So Sierra Charlie 4 will convert the output of this into the 
uh, connector that your phone has. Or if you're looking to invest in a, a posh um, video mic, also consider the video mic NTG, which I don't have here, but is the new kind of shotgun one. And the video mic NTG has got a USB connector and it can be a USB microphone as well. So you can actually record USB audio directly to your computer as well. And we've just announced an adapter cable that goes from USB to lightning. So it means you can plug a video mic NTG directly into a phone and do streaming or record to the phone using that Rode Reporter app. So kind of if you're if you want to get like the best video mic, quote unquote, uh, get a video mic NTG and the um, SC15 is the name of the new cable. Um, hopefully that answers the question, obviously. Um, so um, let's just quickly talk about EQ and compression finally, and that sort of that wraps us up because this is basically the, the another sort of confusing world, I think, for folks who are new to audio, but it's really important. Um, and I'm, as I say, there's going to be another talk where I will actually demo some of these things and talk about them on camera, you know, show them being used. Um, but here I'll just talk about what they are. In short, EQ is short for equalization and is a tool to rebalance the frequency spectrum. So remember, when before we were talking about frequency spectrum, the human voice occupies a part of that spectrum. What EQ lets you do is adjust it. And so the kind of things that you might like to do, it's it's used as both a corrective tool. So you know, you might find as you're listening to something that there's a kind of um, boomy quality to someone's voice in a way that is unpleasant, or there's a certain kind of tone that's getting in your ear. And you can use EQ to remove or reduce that tone. And so it becomes less of an issue. Um, something that I would mention in the next talk, but I'll mention here is a, just a this the best piece of advice I can give you is have a piece of reference video to refer to when you edit and mess around with these tools. And by which I mean a piece of video that you know to be good and you like the sound of that you can stop what you're doing, go and watch and then come back to what you're doing to compare the two. That is the best way to give yourself objectivity. It's something that many professionals like myself forget to do. And it's what will keep you objective when you're making subtle, small changes to things that are hard to, to see. So have reference. But in short, EQ is used to can sweeten. It can, if something's a bit muddy, it can bring some of that sparkle back. If something's a bit boomy, it can take some of that away. If you forgot to put the high pass on and you need to apply it, then EQ is how you do it. So EQ is a very a useful tool. And if you kind of Google EQ and compression for dialogue, you'll find some tutorials that explain it, but I'm going to do one as well. And then what is a compressor? Well, a compressor in in short, is like a volume knob again, but an automated one where the function of a compressor is to take the loudest parts of your audio and bring those bits down so that everything is roughly average in volume level. And that's important because as you've recorded an interview, you know, people, if someone's expressive, they're like moving around and kind of like, you know, they may be becoming louder or quieter during a interview. And what you do not want is someone watching your video back to have to adjust the volume constantly. Oh, that bit's too loud. Oh, that bit's too quiet. That bit's too loud. That bit's too quiet. It is through compression that you can most easily even out the differences between loud and quiet. And so those two tools, EQ and compression, those are the brightness and contrast of the audio world. You know, everything else is a kind of, um, you know, a sort of bonus, you know, other types of processes. And I would highly recommend a style of compressor called an LA-2A style. LA-2A refers to a vintage uh, compressor which was so simple to use. It only had two dials, and one of which was volume. Um, you just turn down a thing that says peak reduction, and what happens is it automatically drops the level once it goes beyond a certain threshold. And it does so in a way that's quite um, transparent. It's not very, very obvious that it's being compressed. 
Um, you know, and so I recommend that the Waves uh, CLA two A is often on sale, um, and is uh, yeah, I think at the moment it's like fifty dollars or less, and I, I can't recommend it enough because you can set that on your dialogue track, get it so it's working, and you can kind of just forget and just get on with your life. Um, so it's it's like the most foolproof compressor. It's the one I've used the most. I use it on literally every video I make. I've got an LA two A style compressor on Voices because it just sounds good and it always keeps it in in the pocket um now so that's kind of what they are hopefully that makes sense eq for sweetening and correcting sound problems um compression for evening out volume but speaking of sound problems um there is there are sort of two kind of killer problems um and those are denoising and de-reverb and these are problems that that you often run into, you know, I've got a bit too much hiss or not hiss. I've been in a loud environment. You know, we go and do the BVE and the photography show, you know, videos recorded in big echoey spaces like that. You know, you're hearing a lot of echo and so on and so forth. Um, and you may wish to reduce that. So um, EQ can't really do that. Like, not really. It can't. Um, it's not designed for kind of constant sort of... Um, well, it just isn't designed for that purpose, quite simply. Um, and so noise, which refers to like hiss as well, is, is something you could, if you used EQ to do it, it would damage other things. You know, it would make the sound sound muffled in a way which would not be desirable. So you we have got plugins that can help us with this. And they are literally just called denoises and dereverbers or dereverb tools. Um, there are native ones in programs like Premiere, uh, which I have tried. And they are very good. Um, so there's not a great deal to say other than I'm reminding you that they exist because they can save a lot of those problems. And I suppose the key thing is not to overdo them. Um, you will find that the solution can become weirder than the problem if you overdo denoising tools. There is a sort of audio artifact that you hear that sounds like kind of tinkling. There's this sort of weird, sort of almost like wind chime sound that happens. Um and de-reverbing similarly can create odd sort of pumping and strange. So reverb, by the way, refers to the sound of an echoey room. So, hey, I've recorded something and I was too far away. There's an echo. Well, there are de-reverbing tools. It is by far the hardest problem to deal with. It's one best avoided. And it's why I've just basically spent the last hour saying to you, get close, get close, get close. Because if you get close then there's less, that's how you get rid of reverb. Um, but there are tools, you can use them a bit, but just use them judiciously and refer to your, um, you know, your reference audio just as a yardstick of that's what it should sound like and I've gone too far or not enough. Um, and then I'm going to mention a piece of software. I don't work for this company, but I will shout it out specifically with my hand thoroughly on my heart because Isotope RX is a is the name of a sort of suite of software from Isotope, uh, who are a software company. Um, so RX is the name of the program. In short, it's a, a sort of professional, like, audio cleanup program. Um, and it's available in multiple different versions. There's like an Elements, which is very basic, a standard, and there's an Advanced, I think, as well. What it does is it has denoising, like in Premiere, but on RX, you can go much further and you don't hear the tinkling. You know, that sort of, you know, there are still kind of some effects from insane levels of use. But in short, you pay some money for those tools and you can take them a lot further than the ones that come free as part of, you know, the the, the editor you use. Um I have used RX on every single video I have made since I got a copy of RX, it has solved a great many problems that I thought were insoluble. And it goes beyond denoising. RX can solve uh, clipping. Clipping is when you go hard up to the edge of your, you've over-volumed the recording. RX can declip, and I have declipped audio on videos, and I have never been pulled for it. Do you know what I mean? I've never had people go, wait a minute, you declipped that, like that you made a mistake, like... It's um, it's like 95% solved, you know, the problem. And so it becomes, uh, it, 
by far is one of the most important pieces of equipment that I use is this software. And also just to say, if you do pay up for the for the bigger versions, they're denoising. They have different denoising kind of um, like plugins within them. Uh, Dialog Isolate um, is in the very, very pro one and is very good. It is is almost sort of voodoo-like in its ability to reduce extraneous noise and preserve the human voice. Um, uh, but there is a spectral denoise that's in standard and there is a de-reverb de as well, which is very decent. Um, and I've used spectral denoise a great deal. It's very good. If you have air conditioning and kind of constant sounds, what you do is you train it. You, you select a little bit of the air conditioner alone, you know, in between when someone spoke, you select that section, train the algorithm and apply it. And it, it subtracts that from the rest of the audio. And it does so in a way that preserves the speech. So it's, it's intelligently going, hey, that's the bit you don't want. I'll leave everything else. That's, that is worth money uh, to me. And so I recommend it heartily. And it's, um, I suppose the main point with it is make a note now. Don't buy these things, but know they exist for that time you've taken a paying job because this may well, you know, $399 may well save a job, you know, and earn you money. So bear it in mind. Um, and then lastly, Foley, just to mention, because I said earlier on, you know, a lot of this stuff is faked. Um, be aware there's this thing called freesound.org, which is a fantastic website that has lots of ambience, um, sort of noise and cities and parks and um, room tone, different sounds and footsteps and things that you can use royalty free i think you know with credit obviously um and basically you would use your good dialogue and kind of fake everything else um, it's a great resource it's free um and be aware that it exists in short uh, so obviously we've had questions i'll just mention that kind of the shopping list um you know just to sort of quantify some of what i said is you should mention headphones. You do need good headphones because it gives you kind of a detailed ability to hear um, cl closely and carefully and to hear to a very low you know, low frequency, things that speakers couldn't do. I've used uh, Sony MDR7506s, which are quite well known uh, and are good. Um, and a lot of folks ask us, like, which of the video mics should I get? You know, I'm doing videography. I can only afford one. Which one do I get? I would... I say to those people, I would get the Video Mic Pro as your kind of entry level. That's because the Video Mic Pro has plus twenty, and that plus twenty is a hiss defeating technique. It will ensure that no matter what camera you have, even if it doesn't have amazing input quality, that it will be able to be hiss free. That's sort of that is the the function of the plus 20 at its best. So it defeats hiss. And that's the most affordable of the shotgun mics that has it. Um, Dead Cat VMP is the name of the wind cover that goes over it because you need to get that for shooting outside. And then when I mentioned the, the boom poles, micro boom pole is the most affordable boom pole. It's like two meters, um, very inexpensive, like under £45. And the VC1 is the extension cable that I mentioned. Uh, that should be under 15 or so. And then I would definitely recommend, like, if you do need wireless, Wireless Go as just a solution to have in your kit bag, as well as Smart Labs, which doesn't really mention there, but oh no, oh no, look, Cat's Cradle. Um, but having a Smart Lab or two will kind of save you. In those instances where you've gone to film something, you thought that you were going to be filming it in a certain way, and then someone goes, no, you have to be you over there. You have to stand 25 feet away. Um, <laughs> then you need your Lavalier. So having a lab solution, be a wireless go or be a smart lab is, is very, very wise. So yeah, that's it. That's all about amazing audio. And I hope that's been helpful. It's been feature length. Good grief. I um, really appreciate that. Yeah, Alex. Thank you. You're welcome. Like, really, really good. Thank you so much for that. It's, it's definitely good. And I've sent a link in the chat. Um, so everyone's got the link to your second session, which I'm very much looking forward to Sweet. on the 12th at 2 oh, p.m. Good. But I just want to thank everyone for attending and also everyone. Um, and more thanks to you for delivering that. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're very welcome. And again, yeah, thank you, everyone, for your attention. And good luck. Yeah, enjoy your filming. I hope you have a good, good sounding results. <laughs>